Hello everyone, my name's Emily and this is SumSub, a channel all about survival in the digital jungle. We've become more dependent on computers and smartphones than maybe we thought. Try to count, how many telephone numbers can you remember by heart? Most probably you know your own telephone number, maybe even your home phone number if you have one, and that's all. At the beginning of the 2000s, each of us remembered dozens of telephone numbers, the numbers of our friends, our parents and work colleagues. But smartphones totally remove the need to remember strings of unrelated digits. We've also become more vulnerable. Imagine that you're strolling around the centre of Rome, admiring the grandeur of the Colosseum, and all of a sudden a thief grabs your bag or rucksack and makes off with it. You've lost your phone and your wallet. What do you do next? Are you able to explain what happened without the help of Google Translate? Can you find the road back to your hotel without a sat-nav? Can you even get in touch with any of your friends or family to tell them what happened? We really don't notice how computers have become such an integral part of our lives. Every year we shift more and more routine tasks over to them. They're better than us at processing huge amounts of data, they work without rest or lunch breaks, and they never make mistakes. Well, almost never. And this almost is not without consequences. Sometimes it can turn into losses of money, reputation, or even life. Today, we'll discuss whether or not we should trust our digital assistants. Look at this sweet little elderly woman. Her real name is Leslie Shook, but thousands of Americans whose lives she saved call her Bitching Betty. Now, this might sound rude to you, but this nickname was invented by people who, by the nature of their activities, their work, often risk their lives every day. I'm talking about the pilots of the American F-18 Super Hornet fighters. During takeoff and landing, they have to simultaneously monitor several dozen parameters, altitude, speed, course, flat position, and so on. This is an incredible load, even for highly trained pilots. In such conditions, such as bad weather with strong winds or damage to the aircraft, the probability of errors increases significantly. To alert the pilots to dangerous changes in these flight parameters, Boeing engineers have created a system of voice prompts. This is called the cockpit warning system. And the voice of this system? Leslie. Any pilot, having heard her short, demanding orders, won't hesitate to carry them out. Flight controls. Flight controls. Bingo. Bingo. Now, it sounds a lot like a navigator in a car, doesn't it? But you definitely shouldn't blindly follow the navigator's instructions. Otherwise, you might find yourself cruising along the bottom of a lake, as happened to a resident of the Canadian city of Kitchener. A 23-year-old woman was returning home late at night in thick fog with roadsides barely visible. So the girl was relying almost totally on the navigator's commands rather than by road signs. And after another turn, the car was in the water. The navigator had laid out a route right across the bottom of Lake Ontario. Fortunately, the girl managed to get out of the sinking car and reach the shore. But how did this happen? Most likely there was once a ferry crossing in this place, which was recorded by the map in the navigator and therefore the programme boldly plotted a route through it. The girl was very tired. This story took place around midnight in poor visibility, so she simply didn't notice that instead of driving along the road, she'd found herself on a boat ramp. But her biggest mistake here was trusting the electronic assistant. Make a right Maybe turn. it's a shortcut, Dwight. It said go to the right. It can't mean that. There's what, a lake there. I think it knows where it is going. This is the the lake. machine this knows. Is the lake. Stop yelling at me. No, it's Stop not yelling. yelling. There's no road here. Car navigators are a great example of an unreliable advisor. In terms of communication, they're similar to the computer in the F-18 fighter. They also give clear and simple commands. But the key difference is in the amount of information they operate on. The aircraft's computer receives information from several hundred sensors, enabling it to clearly determine its position in space, its speed and flight parameters. It has the radar data of the fighter itself, as well as other aircraft at its disposal. To determine the coordinates of the plane, it uses the military protocol of working with GPS, additional signals from ground stations, and in case of satellite failure, it continuously calculates the position of the aircraft using an inertial system. During landing, even more external data is used. The course glide system of an airfield or an aircraft carrier, radio beacons, and so on. Now, by comparing all of this data, the computer can detect failures in the operation of individual sensors, and this won't affect the accuracy of its orders. By contrast, the navigator in the car is deaf and blind. 
It lives in the past. The route is based on a pre-compiled and uploaded map. Any changes are delayed, especially if we're talking about built-in navigators, which most often have to be updated at service centres. The only thing the navigator knows about the real world is GPS coordinates. But even these aren't so straightforward. In civilian systems, this channel is not protected. Therefore, the resulting coordinates can easily be distorted or substituted. This is called GPS spoofing. For example, regular cyber engineers claim that thanks to such an attack, they actually managed to force a Tesla car off the road. The lack of data about the outside world is the main obstacle to the emergence of fully-fledged autopilots for ordinary cars. Now, I'm impressed by the success of Tesla. They almost managed to create a system that can analyse the situation in real time. But unfortunately, this very word, real, almost spoils everything. In real life, there are too many chaotically changing parameters on the road. So sometimes a computer turns into a blind colonel driving a Ferrari. Watch out! Don't blame me, Charlie. I can't see. So autopilots took root in aviation, where all systems are duplicated two or three times, where any system passes dozens of tests and during real flights uses the most complex ground infrastructure. Autopilot also performs well in conditions where the number of external factors is reduced to a minimum for example, on the railways or in the subway. And yet in our cars, we continue to trust computers that operate with wholly insufficient amounts of data. So if you're not a supersonic fighter pilot, never take the instructions of your navigator or computer as an order. Now, this is just my recommendation. You can make your own mind up about this. Now, unfortunately, insufficient data is far from the only problem. Even if the computer receives complete and reliable information, this doesn't mean that new errors won't occur. And for those of you who love our videos about money laundering and the fight against this type of fraud, there is important news. Our second channel, Some Sub for Experts, has published an interview with one of these AML stars, Yanos Ashiotis. Now, Yanos is a Grant Thornton professional whose expertise is landing global financial businesses on Cyprus regulatory soil. Our host and Chief Legal Officer Tony talked to him about the future of crypto in the EU and also starting a fully legitimate cryptocurrency exchange in Europe. There's a lot of requirements, but people that are in the crypto industry uh, are not going to find these things uh, um, to be extreme. Sounds interesting? It is, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. On our channel, Bradley, Lucas and I have repeatedly told you that your phone is a real snitch. A mobile phone, even a simple push-button Nokia, constantly exchanges information with base stations. Recording this exchange helps the police to establish where your phone was at the time of a crime, or conversely, to identify users who were near a certain place. Police in many countries use similar methods, but they don't always work correctly. In 2019, a scandal broke out in Denmark over a system of automated identification of suspects in crimes. Two serious errors were found at once in the algorithm of the data processing module of mobile operators. The first of them was due to the fact that the system discarded some of the data, which sometimes significantly distorted the coordinates of specific mobile phone users. Therefore, innocent people could suddenly find themselves at the scene of a crime. The second error caused the distortion of data on the movement of users between towers, in some places swapping the location of criminals and law-abiding citizens. Just two inaccuracies in working with the data led to the revision of 10,700 criminal cases in which the results of the system were used. The result of the investigation dealt a huge blow to the image of the entire Danish law enforcement system. The reputation of telecom companies also suffered. In this situation, only the lawyers were satisfied. They had more arguments with which to defend their clients. So far, in fact, they've already managed to secure the release of 32 convicts whose charges were based on the use of phone geolocation data. Can you imagine what it's like to spend several years of your life in prison just because someone made a small mistake in a computer program? But sometimes errors in the code are not just errors, but malicious intent. Have you ever heard of nationalist computers? Unlikely, unless you're Dutch. The fact is that the social services of this wonderful country use computers to process information about the payment of childcare benefits. The system helped employees of the social services process these applications for these payments, assess the real wealth of families and analyse the use of these benefits. 
However, it turned out that officials and programmers made the system a little biased. For example, if one of the parents was not a Dutch citizen or had dual citizenship, he was automatically assigned the status of an unreliable person. Such people automatically became suspected of fraud. And even minor formal errors when filling out questionnaires and forms were considered to be deliberate criminal actions. Of course, all this should have been easy to spot by people working in social services. But unfortunately, they too often relied on the opinion of the computer system without understanding the reasons they approved of the computer's verdict. Computer says yes. All this turned into a big scandal, which in 2021 led to the resignation of the entire cabinet of ministers of Mark Rutter. The Dutch government now has to pay a fine of 2.75 million euros and compensation to the victims at an average of 30,000 euros per family. As far as I know, this fine was the first payout for automated discrimination of citizens. However, similar processes are now developing in other countries that are always making mistakes. In Australia, errors were found in the algorithm that made decisions on the payment of government subsidies. And in Austria, discriminatory algorithms were found in the employment service system. It doesn't like women or the elderly, often underestimating their chances of finding a job. Therefore, if you work in the social sphere or you're engaged in the investigation of crimes, never, and I'll repeat, never trust computer systems. Any decision that affects the fate of other people should only be made by a person as consciously and impartially as possible. And if you're responsible for developing such systems, don't forget that even a small mistake can genuinely ruin the lives of other people. My logic is undeniable. Yes, Vicky, undeniable. So as you can see, sometimes computers take on our weaknesses and prejudices. Perhaps in the future, artificial intelligence systems based on self-learning neural networks will cope with this problem. Bradley's already talked a little bit about them in the video AI Against Money Laundering. So if you want to know how a computer learns to play chess or go by itself, you should head over and give it a watch. Five hundred years before our time, the Greek poet Theognis of Megara wrote that no mortal is free from mistakes. Now, unfortunately, this statement is also true for computers. Do you want me to show you an instance where you can count better than your computer? Try to add up one-tenth and two-tenths in your mind. So, I'm sure you immediately said that the answer is three-tenths. This is elementary maths for a human, but extremely difficult for a computer. Most programming languages operate with numbers according to the IEEE 754 standard. In it, numbers are represented by powers of two. Therefore, one-tenth turns into such a monster. You see, for a computer, this fraction turned out to be slightly more than the true value. The same happens with other fractions. Two-tenths will become a little more, and three-tenths a little less than their real values. Therefore, adding one-tenth and two-tenths together, the computer will get... What the hell? Don't believe it? Well, type this number into your browser and add .com. You will then be taken to a site where examples of programs that calculate these expressions in different programming languages are collected. So you can check for yourself. Now, this contradicts both sound logic and our own experiences. After all, in spreadsheets or calculators, a different, correct result is obtained. So why is this happening? Now, programmers have allowed for rounding the results for such calculations. A long tail of small values is discarded from such fractions. The fraction is rounded up or down, and all calculations are performed according to this value. But sometimes this rounding doesn't quite work as planned, and this can cause some truly fatal errors. For example, accumulated rounding errors led to the death of 28 and the injury of 96 American soldiers. Now, let me tell you the story. On the evening of February 25th in 1991, during the last days of Operation Desert Storm, Iraqi forces launched a missile attack on a barracks in Saudi Arabia. American soldiers considered themselves safe. They were already covered by one of the best air defense systems, the MIM-104 Patriot. It was guaranteed to intercept any missiles that Saddam Hussein had. Only this time, Patriot missed. Due to rounding errors, the system was unable to shoot down the old Scud ballistic missile. The error in the program was spotted almost two weeks before the tragedy. 
Israeli experts had noticed that after eight hours of continuous operation, the system began to miss 20% of targets. On February 16th, the software fix was ready, but it was delivered to the base in Saudi Arabia only on February 26th, the day after the tragedy. The most shocking thing about this story is that the losses could have been avoided even without updating the program. On February 21st, four days before the missile strike, the command issued an order prohibiting the long continuous use of the system. It's just that the concept of long in this instance wasn't defined. If the order had contained clear instructions about the need to restart the guidance computer every eight hours, then perhaps the tragedy wouldn't have happened. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the next catastrophe due to the peculiarities of computerised calculations took place. In 1996, the European Space Agency burned 7 billion into dust in 37 seconds. The first launch of the Ariane 5 heavy lift rocket turned into the most expensive fireworks display in the history of mankind due to a similar software error. Two smaller variables were used to track the speed data. This module was used on the previous generation of rockets, but these Ariane 4 parameters were significantly lower than that on Ariane 5. In half a minute, the speed value went beyond the capabilities of the variable and the program began to interpret them as negative. A small mistake by one programmer obliterated 10 years of hard work by the entire European Space Agency. Tous les paramètres propulsifs sont normaux et la trajectoire est normale. We trust computers too much. According to a study conducted at MIT, Tesla owners rely too much on autopilot capabilities. In 22% of cases, they take their eyes off the road for more than two seconds. Now at a speed of 100 km per hour, this is enough time for a car to cross a football field. So why do we blindly trust imperfect computer systems? Professor Timothy Hoff from New York has been dealing with automation problems in medical institutions for a long time. For example, he interviewed more than 75 colleagues who actively use a computer during patient appointments. Hoff observed that doctors have become less understanding of their patients. They concentrate more on filling out electronic forms and make less decisions about diagnosis and upcoming treatments on their own. We share responsibility with computer systems too easily. This was clearly demonstrated by the investigations into Danish and Dutch social workers. But by its very nature, the brain tends to want to economise its efforts. We're always looking for ways to simplify tasks. And if an automated system can offer us a solution that is suitable, we're all too happy to take it. A mechanism that scientists call automation bias has come into action. We subconsciously trust machines more than ourselves or other people. We're used to making mistakes, we're used to deception, but we don't expect the same behaviour from an inanimate object. Therefore, we trust the strange instructions of the satnav and agree with the recommendations of a supposedly expert system. This is our main mistake. Computers, smartphones, CRM and ERP systems are very complex and intelligent, but still a tool. And furthermore, they're made by human beings with a tendency to make mistakes. According to probability theory, the probability of errors does not add up, but multiplies. So that's why I'm not ready to put my trust in computers just yet. But what about you? Share your thoughts about it in the comments down below. So, all that's left is for me to say goodbye to you. My name's Emily, this has been SumSub, and I'll be waiting for you on the next expedition into the digital jungle. Mm -hmm.